Motor Speedway and ESPN's NASCAR comes to 1993. For the past two days, the top NASCAR Winston Cup teams have been here practicing in preparation for next year's Brickyard 400. It has been a hot and humid two-day period, Benny, but it's been fun. It has been unbelievable. I had no idea that it got this hot at Indianapolis in the summertime. What, 9,500 degrees? It's been hot. <laughs> Real hot. <laughs> Normally, it doesn't get this hot, though. It did rain last night, but no rain during the actual practice session. Now, the practice was for next year's Brickyard 400, which, of course, is the first NASCAR Winston Cup race to be held here. They've been running Indy cars at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway since 1911, but the tradition will be broken next year, and a new tradition will begin with the Brickyard 400. <laughs> it and they will come tradition that is a new one for the indianapolis motor speedway in august of 1994 when the brickyard 400 makes its debut as a hot and humid summer indiana sun tried its best to surface the cars were readied the drivers prepared and the crowds arrived the king was there and so was his heir to the throne they tried to get him to sing back home again in Indiana, but that's all they know. <laughs> they only know like the first three or four words. Ohio. Okay, sing back home again in Ohio. Uh, <laughs> An early morning driver's meeting reminded participants that they were still visitors to the hallowed grounds of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The uh, pit wall is the limit for foot traffic, guys. Don't step over the pit wall. Your car can come in, get tire temperature readings, but keep your body on this side of pit wall. That's one of the things that they really regulate here. We need to respect their, the way they do things. Jeff Bodine was first in line as the cars roared out, and it was Bodine who would lead the first lap, barely edging Winston Cup points leader Dale Earnhardt into turn one. You wanted to lead that first lap, didn't you? I would have. They blocked me. But you, know, you got the green, I led the first lap. Pass him going down in one. Why not? He backed off. Bodine would rip off a lap at 165 plus on Monday, second fastest of the day in the number seven car, which he recently bought from Alan Kowicki Racing and will race full time next year. The machine is aptly dubbed Miss Indianapolis. You know, the story behind all this, you see the bobsled uh, on this car a lot. So that's when we don't have a sponsor that's paying for the car for a particular race. We'll put our my bobsled project down here, trying to promote some interest for that. This Miss Indianapolis is uh, a result of a contribution that Tony George, the Holman family, and the Speedway here made towards our project, about a quarter of a million dollars worth of uh, contributions. So the least we could do was, when we came here to test, was put Miss Indianapolis on the side of it, USA 1, because USA 1 in the Olympics will be named Miss Indianapolis. We're hoping to have some other misses out there, too, like Daytona and some of our NASCAR trucks. And what became of the Bud Moore-owned Motorcraft Ford, which Jeff will finish the season in? Hey, Bud, this is Jeff Bodine's car. What you got for a driver? Well, right now, Jeff driving his own car over here, and uh, we're getting this different one. Morgan Shepard just shook it down. So. What about me? Can I make a lap? Well, if we can get you in there, I'll tell you right now, we'll let you do it. If I can get in the car, I can make a lap. If we can get the seat where you can be in that comfortable. Okay, I got a, a uniform, I got a helmet. Let me go change. I'll be back. I'll be back. Okay, I'm ready. What do you mean, where's the rule? I've got to tell you, Major. Yeah. What? Oh, come on, let me see now. Just let me see. Take that wheel off there. Let me see. Oh, I'll never get out. <laughs> hey, I'm almost in. Got a problem here, bud. <laughs> I got a problem. <laughs> it took a while for caution to become courage, but when it did, the testing got serious. Bobby Labonte was the day's fastest at 165.624 and was excited about the Brickyard's tradition. Uh, going around this place is just uh, unreal. I've seen on TV. I've been here for qualification day, and 
uh, it really is uh, a lot to it. You come to the garage area and, and they've got their way they do things and, and, and we do them that way now. So you know with the presence of that, uh, the tradition stands and it should always stand. Ken Schrader was third quickest out of the gate at 164.754. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal, you know, to go out. I mean, it's the, the premier facility, you know, the Indianapolis racetrack. It's kind of unreal to go out there. One of NASCAR's top rookies, Indiana's own Jeff Gordon, grew up in the shadow of the Speedway and was the fourth quickest on the day. I don't know how to describe it. It, it was just an unbelievable feeling, you know, just pulling out onto the... To the um, warm-up lane and, and riding around just seeing all the people going crazy you know uh, and then getting out there on the race line the race is so smooth and i mean just it's it, it was just a beautiful sight another nascar newcomer on this muggy monday was no stranger to the speedway at all indycar veteran john andretti charged out in the kellogg's car at better than 161 miles an hour i'm looking forward to it. new knows maybe i'll maybe i'll do both races here next year most of the drivers couldn't believe the tremendous fan support for what amounts to no more than a tire test. Well, I just can't believe all the people that's here for testing. Uh, you know, we've got so many here testing. Uh, it looks like uh, we're to be having a race out here now, but 300-some thousand people, it's going to be unreal. When NASCAR tested at Indianapolis in 1992, the Speedway had a different configuration. An apron separated the infield grass from the track allowing the drivers a cushion on which to run through the corners. Well, for 1993, the cushion is gone, but will the racing be any different? You know, they took out about a car width wide, and it doesn't matter to us for the standpoint of, sure, it's going to be a little harder to pass. You're going to have a little less racetrack, but everybody's got to run the same place. So it doesn't feel any different to me. Uh, that corners feel good, and so far, so good. I, I think it's going to be a good race. I don't think you're going to see a single file through the corners like they talked about since they moved the apron i don't see a problem with the apron being moved you don't i don't even miss it don't even know it's gone day one of the two-day testing session ended but with a taste of how misleading the speedway smooth and fast racing surface can be and how unforgiving the walls can be coming out of turn four kenny wallace lost control spun crashed hard into the inside wall and came to a rest at the pit entrance wallace suffered a cracked shoulder blade and was done for the week Benny, the race doctor, Terry Trammell, walked by here a few minutes ago, and you asked him about Kenny Wallace. What do you have to say? He said Kenny would be able to run Bristol with a revised seat. They'd have to go back in the area that he broke the shoulder blade and have to make a seat to protect that spot because it's going to be very sore there. Well, believe it or not, there was even more speed and more action during the second day of NASCAR Comes to Indy 1993, and we will be back to take a look at that and more in just a moment. Landmarks here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Yard of Bricks. I'm Bob Jenkins along with Benny Parsons, and we're reviewing the past two days of NASCAR Winston Cup practice. NASCAR comes to Indy 1993. I've never heard a crowd estimate uh, for yesterday, Benny, but I've heard something around 100,000 people that came out just to watch the cars test and practice. And it was just not people from the local area. It was people from everywhere, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. They just came from every place like a magnet to the racetrack. <laughs> they wanted to see day number two of testing for next year's Brickyard 400. Okay, guys, what do you think? Oh, we love it. We love, love it. it. Indianapolis Great. is the greatest. Even though some parts of Indiana had 10 inches of rain overnight, the fans still turned out in huge numbers for the second day. Why am I here today? That's why I'm here today. Mark Martin, who's won two straight NASCAR Winston Cup races, got up to 165.905 and learned a lot that he'll be able to apply next year when August the 6th rolls around. You're just going to do it where you can, and different cars are going to have strengths and weaknesses, and you're going to have to play off of those, uh, you know, use your strengths to your best advantage and uh, cover your weaknesses the best you can, and, and, uh, and uh, it's going to be fine. P.J. Jones, son of 1963 Indy 500 winner Parnelli, was the only car to have wall contact in the morning session, and it was relatively minor. P.J. has been coming here longer than probably any other driver. It's thrilling to be able to go drive around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, you know, the place that 
where, I, where I've been all through my, I mean, when I was a kid, I was two weeks old, I was here. So to be able to finally get out on the racetrack and uh, who would ever believed it would have been in a stock car, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed it. The track was closed for an hour at noon. <laughs> at that time, King Richard took his car around the same two and a half mile oval for a few ceremonial laps at 151 miles per hour. Then donated the car to the Hall of Fame Museum. I tell you, I'm, I'm really, really honored to be able to present uh, a stock car to the Indies car museum uh, you know I, i've always wondered uh, why they wouldn't get take one of my cars but anyhow they they finally put one in there and it, it, i tell you it's, it's a real real honor and to me just run around here at 150 mile hour uh, been around the pace car first time i've ever been around a real race car but to see all the history this year uh you know i'm pretty much history myself but not uh, this particular part of of the world and uh, Makes me feel really, really honored that uh, I were able to uh, give the car and also make a lap around the, the racetrack. And uh, I think that uh, all the people in Indianapolis, all the racing fans uh, uh, from everywhere, uh, whether IndyCar fans or stock car fans, I think this is just going to really be a great deal for everybody involved. And uh, hope you all come back in May and then come back in August, okay? Well, as if Richard Petty hasn't given his son Kyle enough to shoot for, now he's donated the car to the museum. Kyle, another pressure from the king. Yeah, it is. I guess I'm going to have to come up here and win this first race and just donate that car. But uh, I, it's all, uh, with everything he's ever done, it, it's fitting that he has one of his cars up here. But you've just brought up a good point. You could win the first Brickyard 400, and that car would go straight to the museum. I tell you what, I think with Felix, knowing Felix like I do and Mella Yella, if we won this race, they'd drive it straight from here, straight over there, park it, take my helmet out of it, and that'd be the end of it. How is the racetrack? You enjoying yourself? Yeah, we've had a good time. You know, nine of us came up here last year. We had a great time last year. The people here are great. The people at the Speedway are great, and the fans are incredible up here. And, I mean, it's like they're starved for this sport to come to this Speedway. And, you know, all 30 of us came up here, 35 of us came this time. Uh, there were a couple of accidents, so we got that out of our system. So I think we'll be ready to come back and race. Talk about the accidents. It looks like this racetrack is going to be tough to run two or three abreast like they're talking about. It, it's, as you know, it's, it's going to be like Pocono. You know, you can't go too wide over the tunnel at Pocono. It's tough to go too wide through three at Pocono. And basically, that's the way this racetrack is. You just pitch the cars through the corners and let them slide out. And if your car's working pretty good, then you can do it. But if somebody's on the outside of you or you're on the inside of somebody that's really coming, it's going to be a little bit tougher. But it'll be a good Winston Cup race. At Pocono, the cars shift down that long straightaway. Are you shifting here? We've, we've done it both ways, and surprisingly, the shifting really works good on new tires uh, when, you, when you've got the first 10 or 12 laps. But after that, it's just as easy not to shift, and the speeds stay up pretty good. So, you know, we might run into a deal here, unlike Pocono, where we'll run part of, the, part of a tire stop shift in the car and then go straight to overdrive and leave it and get, let the drivers get lazy and rest a little bit and then go back to shifting again. It must be kind of tough going in the corner, what, 175, 80 miles an hour and having to shift the car? I tell you what, it surprised me the whole time we've been here that when we came here last time, not shifting, you use a ton of brake getting in this first corner and a ton of brake getting in the back corner. And the gear ratios now and the transmission are so much different. You jam that thing up in third gear and you never have to touch a brake. You can go out here and run and run and run and never have to hit the brakes except when you come in the pit. So, you know, that kind of amazed me a little bit. But uh, if you got that gap too big, that rear end gets squirrely. And I'm going to tell you what, that first corner gets awful tight. The first corner, two abreast, three abreast on that first lap. I tell you what, I wouldn't be surprised to see him four abreast on that first lap, but, uh, you know. Back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and ESPN's NASCAR comes to Indy 1993. I'm Bob Jenkins, along with Benny Parsons. Now, after the lunch break, during which Richard Petty took the ceremonial laps around the track and presented his car to the museum, we had some real excitement. We got about uh, eight or ten cars out there on the racetrack. We wondered if this was going to happen, and indeed it did. They lined up behind the pace car and then threw the green flag for what I guess you could call some drafting practice. Drafting practice, and NASCAR told the guys, please be, please be careful because we don't know what's going to happen here. Well, they went down in turn one. Brett Bodine pulled up behind John Andretti in the 14 car. Andretti lost it, and other cars come piling in. P.J. Jones in nine. There's Mark Martin in the six car, and Jimmy... Spencer in the 12 car also involved. 
And this was very unfortunate because John Andretti, of course, has not really been officially announced as a driver of this car for next year. We assume that he's going to drive it, at least here at the Brickyard 400. So it was a real unfortunate situation for John. It was for him, and I tell you what, he was almost like a whip puppy talking to him. He said he felt like the drivers was going to be blaming him, and it was his fault. He spun out in front of those guys, and they were really going to be down on him. But I think that they understand that he is a rookie. He's got a lot to learn. And, and Mark Martin, I asked him what happened. He said, well... Terry spun out. I said, you mean the 14 car? He said, yeah, Terry spun out. I said, John Andretti was in the 14 car. Oh, my goodness, I forgot all about that. <laughs> but on the other hand, this drafting practice is really as essential as any other kind of practice because that is the condition they will experience on race day. They have to do that because it, that's the only way you're going to win the race is draft and go by people down the straightaway, get position so you can go in their corner. So, yes, drafting practice is essential. Now they got to wait until next August to do that unless they bring back six race cars in mass sometime in the spring. Now, we thought maybe that they would have another session of drafting practice, but after that incident with John Andretti and the others, it was pretty much a one car on the racetrack at a time deal the rest of the afternoon. Did yeah, they kind of kill that idea? said, look, you know, we've torn up four cars. That's enough. Go out and practice. Let's get this on. 2.30. We're out of here. That was the real only major incident of the two-day period, and again, John Andretti and the others were not injured in the incident, but there was a lot of sheet metal damaged in the final hour or so of testing here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But we'll take a break and be back with more as we talk with uh, one of the participants next year in the Brickyard 400, Daryl Waltrip. That coming up. Welcome back to our special here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I'm Bob Jenkins along with Benny Parsons and the guy next to me in the middle is the driver of the Western Auto Chevrolet, Daryl Waldrop. Now, okay. in the next few minutes, what we want to do, Daryl, is talk about what might happen next August. We want to put you in uh, the starting lineup, hopefully up front. Tell us exactly what kind of a race it really is going to be and, and how you will approach the Brickyard 400. Yeah, I, you know, I think if you just look at the Indy 500, you know, they start three wide, and uh, those cars are actually tread width wise are much wider than our cars are. So they have no problem at all coming down to take the green flag. They say they're three wide. <laughs> I've never seen them come down actually three wide. They've been all over the place, but still the racetrack is, is plenty wide to come down for us two abreast and actually go through the first turn and into the short shoot and out on the back straightaway two abreast. I think that's where the real racing will start. All of us have kind of learned, for the most part, we got to get through that first turn, we got to get through the second turn, we got to get on the next straightaway. Things get strung out a little bit, and if you want to know where racing's going to start, it'll be up that long back straightaway, and then you're going to get real tense as you get near the third turn. That's where the trouble's going to be. Are we going to see two abreast racing here at the Brickyard? Oh, I think so, Benny. I was concerned, uh, you know, after we he tested here last year and they changed the racetrack the way they did, I was concerned about uh, the amount of room that we were going to have to race on because when we were here, we were three wide through the turns, but two of us were on the apron. Right. But in fact, I think what will happen when we get here and we get into a racing mode and get into racing conditions, we will move another groove up. There's plenty of room to get into turn here three wide. The problem is, is making it across that short shoot side by side so I believe what will happen I believe that somebody will get bold and they'll move out a little bit and get that groove worked in a little bit better getting into one and you'll be able to go on the outside of a guy and take position and hold it all the way through the short shoot onto the next straightaway but will the best passing points here be on the straightaways or maybe coming off the straightaways it's going to be just like the Indy cars were you know they used to pass everywhere and now they had to kind of set a guy up and draft by him I think you're going to see the same things with our cars the one thing our cars do though that the Indy cars don't a guy drafts up on you, he slingshots by you going into the third turn, and he goes in hot to get past you. He slides up next to the wall, and while he's doing all that sliding, you drive right back past him. <laughs> and that's where the fun will be. Just like the Darlings in the past going in Darlings in turn three. Exactly. You know, you get a guy set up, and you get by him, but you can't stay down, and that gives the guy a chance to just drop right back on you and take position away from you. That's the kind of racing we're going to see all day long. You ever heard of Ray Haroon? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. I remember him well, see one. Three races in a row with a rearview mirror. Well, you're close. First rearview mirror was ever on a race car was on his. And the first winner of the Indy 500. Was him. Right. But he didn't win three in a row? No. Oh. Now well, are you, somebody are, did. Are you going to be the inaugural winner of the Brickyard 400? And how important do you think that's going to be? 
I built this car for this race. I have made a great investment in this. I brought this car up here with three different computer systems in it. One for the engine, one for the chassis, one for the aero package. We've put a lot of effort into this, and we're going to be back again next year sometime. Yes, uh, we want our car sitting over in the Hall of Fame with Ray Haron or Macaroni or whatever his name was. <laughs> Depend on it. That's the word from Daryl Waltrip. And Benny and I will be oh, back. I guarantee it. <laughs> we'll be back with more. Was Motor Speedway in just a moment. And Ray Hoon Hoon will be here too. <laughs> NASCAR comes to Indy 1993. I'm Bob Jenkins along with Benny Parsons. And besides, where are you having dinner tonight? What's been the most asked question you've encountered the last two days? Obviously, how do I get a ticket for the Brickyard 400? Everyone seems to think there are no tickets, but I don't think that's the case. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, people are saying that the Brickyard 400 is sold out already. You can't buy a ticket. That is not the case. And to prove that, we talk with the Speedway's Public Relations Director, Bob Walters. The real situation is that we've actually not sold a single ticket yet. As of July 1st, uh, existing Indy 500 ticket holders were allowed to present an application for tickets, and starting Wednesday, the 18th, we'll take uh, ticket orders from everybody else who's not a 500 ticket order. Actual ticket allocation will probably happen sometime this fall. Those ticket applications are being accepted by mail only right now. Well, last year, a brief tire test. This year, a full-fledged practice. One year from now, the Brickyard 400. And I can't wait, Bob, because I spent two days down in the garage here trying to get a mood for things. I want to see a race around the racetrack. I'm excited. I think everyone is. Thank you for joining us as we take a look at NASCAR Comes to Indy 1993. For Benny Parsons, I'm Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone. First thing you get is a race car toy. You have race car underwear on. And they'd be back in 15 minutes. That's right. And they'd want to ride their motorcycle. Aww. It gets programmed into you, and uh, and that's all you know, and that's all you love. And uh, and I think that's why we're doing it, because we love it. Well, Harry Hyde tells me he's got it licked, because he won Ontario. So he says he knows how to set this thing up so it can win. I hope so. All right. <laughs> I think he's still getting in the corner a little bit hard and uh, it's hurting him a little bit coming off. Oh! Well, he missed that deal. He had to spin it. Who was that spun? Andretti. Andretti? Yeah, it'd be pretty neat to come back and, well, even to be racing against each other and coming here. Uh, next August and uh, walking through the same gasoline alley as you once did. <laughs> See, even some people here remember you, Dad. <laughs> Speed Week is brought to you by new advanced high-tech formula Quaker State Motor Oil. It's formulated for today's high-tech engines. And by Budweiser, the king of beers who reminds you friends know when to say when. Coming up, Benny Parsons visits with Stock Car's two winningest drivers of all time. The Fastmasters finals tonight and the NASCAR test session has brought a lot of famous drivers to the city of Indianapolis. Earlier this week at the Brickyard, Benny Parsons sat down and talked with two of Stock Car Racing's best ever. I've got two of NASCAR's all-time champions, all-time victories, Richard Petty with 200 victories, David Pearson 105 victories, and guys, is this just about 10 years too late, Richard? Well, no, I think time is about right. Uh, 
you know, from the standpoint of, I'm, I'm looking at racing from, yeah, it's 10 years too late for Richard Petty or David Pearson, but I think from the racing standpoint, from Winston Cup racing, I think the time is probably good. Uh, I think we're big enough now and can, can handle a deal. I think there's enough people that know about Winston Cup racing. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's just, uh, it's going to be a big show deal, but I think that's what we needed. It sort of takes us from one equine into another. David, did you ever seriously think about running the Indianapolis Motor Speedway back in the open-wheel cars? Well, Ben, uh, back when I was at Chrysler Corporation, you know, they sent me to Atlanta one time to test uh, an Indy-type car, which was Don Branson at the time. And, uh, and, of course, I run just a few laps, and the steering was real quick. And I think they had an eight-to-one steering in the thing. And uh, I tried to get them to put a slower steering, a faster, or a slower steering in it, really. And uh, they said, oh, no. So when you get used to it, said, you'll like it. But... Uh, I run a few laps, and I said, I can't stand it. I'll have to get out. You know? <laughs> Would you like to run the Speedway in a stock car? Well, uh, yeah, I think, of course, you know, we ran uh, Ontario, California, which is about the same thing as, as here. And I'm kind of like Richard. I think it's time for the NASCAR to come up north now. There's uh, enough fans here. You know, when we first came here, I mean, up north, I remember the first time we went to Michigan, they was, uh, people wouldn't holler, they wouldn't do anything. and had a great race, but now uh, they holler if you just go out on a racetrack and practice. Richard, you've got a car in the in the museum. I think it's only fitting that the all-time victory leader NASCAR has a stock car in the museum. Was that a big thrill? Yeah, that, that's a big deal. Uh, you know, we had talked about this uh, a year or two ago about bringing a stock car, but they were still a little uh, shaky about bringing a stock car into IndyCar uh, Museum. And then as quick as they made up their mind about that uh, we were going to run stock cars, I think they called me the next day and see if we could work out a situation to bring a car. So it makes you feel real good that, you know, they call you, they're interested in it, and it's going to be the first stock car in, the, in an Indy uh, museum. So from that standpoint, uh, I think it's a big deal for us. David, you've got a big race coming up Saturday night, the Fast Masters. Uh, was it nice to get back in competition? Well, it is. Of course, uh, only one thing, but I wish we was in the stock cars instead of drag Jaguars. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with Jaguars. I'm just not used to uh, driving a car with an engine in the rear. Now, you got to think about Fast Masters next year because $100,000, see, remember, $100,000. Richard got enough. He don't have to worry about the $100,000. I'm not going to worry about $100,000. As quick as I get $100,000, Clinton's going to call up and say, you owe me, you know, $110,000, so... Uh, <laughs> Heck with it. <laughs> Did you think the stock car racing, David, would ever be as big as it is? No, I didn't, uh, Ben. Of course, every year you think it, uh, you know, as big as it is, as much competition as they are, they say no way it can be any bigger next year. But uh, it's been proven that it, next year is always bigger for some reason. I don't know. Bigger, more fans, cars running faster, better cars, better mechanics, everything, and a closer competition. Kyle. Uh, do you tell him what to do, or is he doing his own thing? <laughs> He's doing his own thing. He always has done his own thing. I mean, long hair, ear bob, you know, the whole deal. Taking a camera in the car with him during the race. You know, all this kind of stuff. He does his own thing. and. Uh, Probably he's done better by not listening to some of the stuff that I told him, but uh, he gets out there by said, I always say that he's his mother's boy, not his daddy's boy. <laughs> Guys, I sure appreciate you coming by and visiting with us. Enjoyed it. David, thank you very much. Thank you, Benny. And Bob will be back with more Speed Week in a moment.